It's 2 p.m. Questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Can the minister guarantee that the government's deal with Central Alliance will deliver domestic gas prices of $7 per gigajoule or less, as demanded by Senator Patrick? The minute, the leader of the government, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. What I can guarantee is that, as a result of the decision of uh, Centre Alliance senators and Senator Lambie and Senator Bernardi, of course, millions of hardworking Australians will get to keep more of their own money. Yeah. They get to keep more of their order, own money. Senator which Cormann, is of course order. Fantastic. Twelve seconds in, and our first point of order, Senator Wong. I asked about gas prices. Um, and. Gas prices. And the, the, the will the question... minister guarantee that the Prime Minister's deal with Central Alliance will deliver domestic gas prices of $7 per gigajoule or less, as demanded by Senator Patrick? Um, I, I will, uh, How many times has Katie order, beaten you? Order. I, I, I will allow. The question was specific. It also referred to a deal. I will allow the minister more than 12 seconds to get to the specifics of the question. I believe he's being directly relevant at the moment. Senator Cormann. Uh, Mr President, it's good to be back. Uh, good to be back. <laughs> now, as I was saying, as, I was saying, uh, as a result of uh, the decision by uh, Senators uh, Griff and Patrick and Lambie and Bernardi to support the government's plan for lower income taxes for all working Australians, yeah. millions yeah. of Australians will get to keep more of their own money. And that is going to be good for them, and it's going to be good for the economy, it's going to be good for jobs, and it's, of course, what the Australian people voted for. Now, it is, of course, well understood that the government has got a long-standing commitment, a long-standing policy commitment, to bring down the price of electricity, including by boosting the supply of gas into the domestic market. And Senator Canavan has done an outstanding job, together with uh, Minister Taylor, uh, in, in helping to bring that about. And I think that Senator Canavan would be able to tell you that gas prices today uh, across the East Coast uh, market are actually uh, substantially lower than they were at their peak. Uh, and of course, uh, our policy measures, our policy measures, our policy measures so far have, have had a significant impact. Well, of course, we want to do more. We want to do more. And let me tell you, like while the Labour Party, you know what the Labour Party was doing while, while Senator Patrick and Senator Griff were talking to us about public policy, while Senator Lambie was advocating uh, public policy for with us, you know what the Labour Party was doing? They were drafting an amendment to change the title of the bill. They were drafting. That is the substantial policy work of the Australian Labour Party after the 2019 election, after the Australian people firmly rejected your high taxing agenda, your politics of envy, because they know it would make Australia weaker and would make Australians poorer. Uh, here you are. Your, your, most substantial, your most substantial contributions to policy debate is to come up with an amendment to change the title of the bill. Order. That is just ridiculous. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you. I note no guarantee. Uh, Senator Patrick has also indicated that the arrangement would require, and I quote, a range of measures including limits on future gas exports and greater transparency on existing deals, end quote, including, and I quote, a gas reservation policy. Can the minister outline how the gas reservation will apply to current and prospective projects and what impact it will have on gas prices? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, what I can confirm for Senator Wong is that today the Senate will have the opportunity uh, to uh, keep faith with the verdict of the Australian people at the last election, and that is by passing income tax relief for all working Australians. Senator in Wong, on a point Second. of order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. I we we make... had the entire primary question where he did not answer the question on gas prices. Are you going to allow him, Mr. Senator, President, to avoid it again? Senator Cormann, this Thank was a you. very specific uh, supplementary question that only referred to gas prices or gas policy. I'd ask you, I remind you of the question. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, it's a matter of public record that uh, the government has got a long standing policy commitment to bring down the price of electricity, including by boosting uh, the supply of gas into the domestic market. It's also a matter of public record that the government has been engaged in positive and constructive conversations with relevant crossbench senators. Those crossbench senators who wanted to pursue uh, issues with us, raise issues with us. Uh, and, uh, you know, order. We have, we Senator have... Cormann, Senator Wong on a point of order. The point of order is direct relevance. I asked about the gas reservation policy. The government has agreed. Um, and Senator, Senator Wong, the minister is also, the, the, the minister's also entitled to address the preamble to the question that was slightly more general in nature, quoting Senator Patrick, and I consider him to be directly relevant to that part of the question at this stage. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, as I, as, I, as I was saying, Mr. President, 
Uh, we have got a long-standing track record and a very comprehensive agenda to bring down the cost of electricity, including by boosting supply of gas into the domestic market. We have, we have of course, discussed that agenda uh, with relevant crossbench senators who were interested in engaging with us constructively and positively, while the Labor Party was drafting amendments to change the title of the income Order, tax uh, reduction bill. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How will the government meet Senator Patrick's demand to deliver domestic gas prices of $7 per gigajoule or less? Can the minister guarantee the price cut will flow through to consumers? And if so, can the minister indicate what price reduction consumers will see? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Firstly, I let uh, Senator Patrick talk for himself. What I will say on behalf of the government, what I will say on behalf of the government, that we have a long-standing commitment to bring down electricity prices, including uh, through sensible reform, including through sensible reforms uh, to policy settings to ensure we can boost the uh, supply of gas into the domestic uh, electricity market. I mean, that's that's something that. Uh, is a matter of uh, record, and indeed, uh, Senator uh, Canavan is always, always exploring uh, new policy options to ensure that we can bring uh, electricity prices down further. Uh, he, he is always looking for ways. He is always looking for ways to do more. And indeed, it's been uh, really good to actually engage with some constructive and positive uh, senators who are keen to uh, who are keen to work with the government to deliver better policy outcomes for the nation. Instead of instead of the uh, you know, politics, the political tactics of the Labour Party, instead of the political tactics of the Labour Party, uh, which is uh, to move an amendment to change the title of the bill. I mean, I wonder how long that would have taken them to take that through court. Order, okay. Senator Cormann. Time for the answer has expired. Order. Order. Senator Stoker. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills and Small and Family Business. How do the results of the Australian labour force figures for the month of May demonstrate how the Morrison government is getting on with the job of delivering for the Australian people? The Minister. Senator Cash. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Mr. President. And again, I thank Senator Stoker for her question. But in particular, can I congratulate Senator Stoker for the great work order, she did on the ground on in left. the uh, election to deliver so many seats to the LNP? Order. And how I say that compares with the efforts that Senator Watt made during the election. I believe every seat thank that you. Senator Watt visited, Senator Watt, you actually lost. A lot of people owe their lack of being here Order. to Senator Watt. But, Mr President, we are a job-creating government. We have put in place since 2013 the right policy framework so that employers out there, the Australian economy, can create jobs. In fact, since we were elected in 2013, Senator Stoker, the economy has now created 1.4 million jobs, Mr President. And as you know, we said we'd create a million jobs when we were first elected in 2013, within five years. Because of the policies we put in place, we delivered that commitment ahead of schedule. And Mr President, in relation to the 1.4 million jobs, over 60 per cent of those jobs they have been full-time jobs. Mr President, the unemployment rate in Australia as at May was 5.2 per cent. When Labor last left office a while ago now, it was 5.7 per cent. And Mr President, the economy continues to create jobs because of the policies that the coalition government have put in place. In May of this year, we actually saw employment in Australia reach an all-time high of almost 12 million 900,000 Australians in work. We also saw, Mr President, though, confidence in the jobs market being the highest ever, with 66 per cent as the participation rate. It is because of the policies of the coalition Order. government— Senator Cash, that time for the quick answer has expired. Senator Stoker, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for that excellent news. Are there any policy risks that the Minister is aware of that could jeopardise these record figures? Senator Cash. Oh, well, Mr President, I think the attitude of those in the chamber today on the other side says it all. They, even though the Australian people voted overwhelmingly on the 18th of May, as the Leader of the Government in the Senate has stated, to endorse the tax plan that we took to the election, those on the other side continue to oppose it. They remain the greatest risk to jobs in this country. They took to the election a plan to tax Australians a further 
$387 billion. Imagine the effect on jobs, Mr President, if that plan had been allowed to go through. But it isn't. It won't, because the Australian people voted against those opposite, the Labor Party's plan for higher taxes, and they endorsed the Coalition's plan in full, all three stages of our policy, to give Australians back more of their own money. Senator Stoker, a final supplementary question. What action is the Morrison government taking to continue to grow our economy and ensure that more Australians are given the opportunity to find a job? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, we have made a commitment to the Australian people that under the Morrison government over the next five years we will put in place the policies, we will build on the policies we already have in place to ensure that the economy can deliver a further 1.25 million jobs. That builds on the one million job commitment that we made in 2013. And we'll do that, Mr President, by ensuring that, and we will, returning the budget to surplus, something those on the other side haven't done for, I think, Senator Cormann, 20 years two decades, will also Mr. President, deliver a record infrastructure spend of in excess of $100 billion. Why? Because we understand that when you invest in infrastructure, you allow the economy to create jobs. And in my portfolio of small and family business, Mr. President, we extended the instant asset write-off so that an additional 22,000 businesses are now covered. Order. Again, Senator we're Cash, all about time getting for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The government wants to spend $95 billion over the medium term to give tax cuts in 2024, five years away. The Grattan Institute states that in order to get spending levels required to fund the tax cuts, and I quote, real spending growth would need to average around 1.3 per cent per annum over the decade or 1.8 per cent if the economy performs as strongly as Treasury projects. Either way, this is substantially lower than any previous government has achieved. Minister, what spending will the government cut in order to fund its tax cuts? Leader of the government, Senator Thank Corbyn. you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, that claim by the Grattan Institute is wrong. Uh, it was, of course, it featured during the campaign. It was comprehensively discredited during the campaign, comprehensively discredited by the during the campaign. In fact, in fact, it was comprehensively discredited by nothing else than the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook, which made very clear, which made very clear that the uh, medium-term projections showing a surplus all the way through, and the medium-term projections which fac factor in a record funding for hospitals and schools and infrastructure and all of the other essential services, that that. It said that our, the cost of the tax cuts is factored in to that forward trajectory based on a no policy change scenario. A no policy, scenario, a no policy change scenario means there are no assumptions of future cuts, as you call it, no assumptions of future savings uh, enshrined in our budget bottom line whatsoever. I mean, this was comprehensively discredited. And I might just say, I might just say the only thing that was missing from Senator Gallagher's question there, as she was talking about uh, $95 billion uh, from 2024-25, was the sneering pre-election reference to the top end of town, the top end of town. Because, of course, what the Labor Party did during the election, I wonder why that is. I wonder why you've dropped that. I wonder why you've dropped that. Because you know, the, fund, the core foundation of your attack on our plan to deliver income tax relief for all working Australians is your attempt to perpetuate the politics of envy, class warfare, turning Australian against Australian. And you know what, you know what happened? The low-income Australians, hard-working, low-income Australians, working-class Australians, mortgage belt suburbs, voted strongly in favour of our plan because they know that it delivers better opportunity for them. And the modern Labor Party would do well to actually reflect why it is that their working class base turned against them. Because if you want to continue to run on a high taxing agenda and the politics of envy, when Australians are fundamentally aspirational, go right ahead. Go right ahead and let's, let's have this battle all the way to the next election. Go Order. to the next election Senator campaigning Corbyn, for higher time taxes the again. The answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a uh, supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, real growth in health expenditure over the decade to 2016-17 was 4.5 per cent. Given that in order to pay for the $95 billion in tax cuts, the government must restrain health expenditure to just over 0.7 per cent per annum, 
What health spending will the government cut in order to fund its tax cuts in five years' time? Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Repeating a lie doesn't make it come true. Uh, our budget actually has substantial increases every year in funding for hospitals, for schools, for infrastructure, for all of the other essential services Australians rely on. And you know what? We have been able to accommodate uh, income tax relief for uh, hardworking Australians, hard Australians in a way that is fiscally responsible. And I mean, this question, you know why this question surprises me? Because in the, in the election, Labor said, oh, we want to have $387 billion in higher taxes because that is what the country needs, that's what the economy needs. Now they're saying we should have more tax cuts sooner. More tax cuts sooner. So, I mean, how is that going to add up? You actually, you want to bring, you want to bring tax cuts forward. Like, I mean, as if anyone believes that you actually believe in tax cuts. But how, how are you going to, how are you going to balance the budget with that? How are you going to pay for hospitals and schools when you do all of that? I mean, your, your position has got no credibility. You're all over the place. You've got more positions on tax than uh, in the Kama Sutra, quite frankly. I mean, this is, like, I mean, if, if we, if we stay here for Order. another week, Senator Cormann, time for the answer. Order, order, order. I'll... Senator, Senator Gallagher, final supplementary question. Thank you. We didn't need the visuals of that. But um, <laughs> my supplementary question is um, analysis undertaken by the Australian Financial Review reveals that spending will need to be cut by $40 billion a year by 2030 ah, so to pay for the tax cuts. So how will the government allocate the $40 billion a year in tax cuts required? Uh, th Senator th thank you very much, Mr President. So what we're getting now is uh, like reference to an article about the Grutten Institute study that was already widely discredited. I mean, you know, th this analysis is wrong. It is false. Uh, I mean, I will, I will send you a copy of the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook, which comprehensively uh, rejects this furphy, completely and comprehensively discredits this furphy. And, but in any event, like, so here you are. You're now saying that we should have more tax cuts sooner. More tax cuts sooner. So how is that going to work? I mean, you know, how, how are you going to make these numbers add up? I mean, here, the Labor Party is all over the place. Quite frankly, you should have long cut your losses. You should have long accepted the verdict of the Australian people. Australians voted for income tax relief for all working Australians, and they voted against the high, Labor's high taxing agenda, against Labor's high taxing agenda and the politics of envy. And you know what? And here they say, oh, there's more elections coming. Be our guest. You know what? You can go to the next election. No, you can go to the next election. Go your hardest, campaigning for higher taxes again. Be our guest. Go to the Australian Order. people. Order. families. Senator Senator again. Wong. The Labor Party is the party for Wong. higher taxes. Senator Cormann, time for the answers expired. Senator Wong. Order. Order. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister. Minister, 717 jurisdictions across 16 countries have made a declaration that we are living in a climate emergency. The UK Parliament, indeed the UK Parliament led by a Conservative government, supported the declaration of a climate emergency and showed global leadership. So, Minister, how does your government justify having such pathetic pollution reduction targets, indeed only 16 per cent? when you take into account carryover credits, how do, you, how do you justify having targets that are completely inconsistent with keeping warming below 1.5 degrees as set out in the Paris Agreement? The Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. And I, I can't answer this question without noting uh, again and thanking the Greens again for having joined with the Liberal National Party senators in voting down. Uh, the carbon pollution reduction scheme uh, that, uh, the, that Senator Wong uh, sought to uh, introduce. And, and, and you know, I'm still, I, I mean, those of us on this side of the chamber continue to be grateful for your efforts to help us properly balance uh, environmental protection with economic responsibility. And that is, that is, of course, the way we approach these things. We are committed to effective action on climate change. When we came into government, we were running behind in terms of meeting our emissions reduction target signed on to in Kyoto. We're now running ahead of meeting that commitment. And we have a plan to meet our emissions reduction targets agreed to in Paris, but we will not take reckless and irresponsible decisions that would harm 
Australian families for no environmental benefit. Sending economic activity and jobs overseas, where for the same level of economic output emissions will be higher, does not help to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. That is just imposing, uh, gratuitously imposing a sacrifice on Australians to make ourselves feel better when we're actually making, when we're actually hurting them for no purpose whatsoever. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. The UK have driven down pollution by 38 per cent since 1990. Ours has increased by 24 per cent over the same period. So here we are, a country of 25 million, contributing more to the breakdown of our climate than the UK population of 66 million. So, Minister, when you're looking at uh, the source of increasing emissions, let's take uh, the gas sector in particular. What are your plans to reduce pollution from the gas sector? Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, you know what? Australia actually helps to reduce uh, emissions in the world by uh, exporting uh, clean energy, by exporting cleaner coal, by exporting gas, uh, by displacing, of course, uh, you know, much more environmentally unfriendly energy sources in other part, parts of the world. And you know, we are a growing population and a growing economy. And in a growing population, a growing economy, and with lots of capacity to help the world uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions in a way that's actually good for our economy. I mean, that's actually, I mean, we are being a good uh, global citizen by, by contributing our gas, by contributing our cleaner coal, by contributing all of these energy sources that will help reduce emissions all around the world at the same time as generating jobs here in Australia. How fantastic is that? And the Greens really uh, should uh, remember uh, Senator, uh, former Senator Bob Brown, who of course was a big advocate uh, of coal. Uh, and I know that uh, if, uh, if, uh, you know, if you're interested, I'm sure that Senator Colbeck is happy uh, to bring that front page out of the Hobart, Hobart Mercury out uh, to remind you again. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. Minister, Minister, in the short months between the last parliament and this one, 18 heat records have been broken in Canada. The worst drought in India's history is threatening the entire cities. In Mozambique, months of rain fell in a few short hours, dislocating 1.8 million people. The World Meteorological Organization said it was a wake-up call to the world. Minister, when will your government wake up to the climate emergency that is before us? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, our government is committed to effective action on climate change. We have uh, very uh, effective. Uh, we've got a very uh, comprehensive and effective measures in place to ensure we meet our emissions reduction targets uh, signed on to uh, in Paris. Uh, and you know, we will we will not impose economic harm on Australia uh, in order to push up emissions uh, in other parts of the world. We're not going to we're not going to harm the Australian economy uh, in order to uh, you know actually increase emissions all around the world. You know that you can you can go to the next election again proposing to harm the Australian economy in a way that doesn't make any difference to the environment. That is a matter for you on our side of uh, uh, Parliament, unashamedly and unequivocally. We will never ever do that. Senator Keneally. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. When the Reserve Bank cut the cash rate to 3.25 per cent, former Treasurer Hockey said, and I quote, the Reserve Bank are cutting interest rates not because the Australian economy is doing well, but because the Australian economy is deteriorating. We are one cut away from emergency levels of a cash rate. Given the Reserve Bank this week cut the cash rate to a record low of 1 per cent, how does the Treasurer describe the current cash rate? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I mean, it, it's no secret. It is absolutely no secret that the Australian economy is facing global economic headwinds and is dealing with some downside risks in the domestic economy. It's absolutely no secret at all, which is, of course, why Labor's agenda of higher taxes and the politics of envy was precisely the wrong way to go, because it would have made our economy weaker. Uh, it would have put jobs at risk. It would have left all families worse off. And, you know, I mean, in a way, in a way we've actually won that policy argument, because the Labor Party, having argued for $397 billion in higher taxes in the campaign, are now saying we should have more tax cuts sooner because that's the right thing to do by the economy. So, I mean, on one hand, you're saying we need more taxes for the economy. 
and we can't legislate tax cuts in the future because uh, that's bad for the economy. And now you're saying we need more tax cuts sooner, even though the budget can't afford that. Uh, so, ah, stimulus, stimulus, Senator, Senator Wong says. Stimulus, Senator Wong. So, well, let, let me tell you what. We have, a, we have a plan to build a stronger economy. It is a plan that we took to the last order, election. Order, Senator Cormann. Senator Gallagher on a point of order. Uh, point of order. Thank you, Mr President. The question was very direct. It asks how the Treasurer describes the current cash rate. We haven't got to that point yet. Well, you reminded the Minister of the question, uh, and I call Senator Cormann to continue. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, in Australia, monetary policy and fiscal policy is absolutely heading in the same direction. Of course, we are focused. Our budget is a pro-growth budget. Our budget, over the last two financial Order. years, we have put forward $302 billion worth of income tax relief for hard-working families. Hard work, $302 billion worth of income tax relief. A $100 billion infrastructure investment pipeline. And indeed, and indeed, and indeed, of course, uh, you know, the Labor Party is arguing in favour of higher taxes, which really their current proposition, uh, maybe that might be position five or seven, I don't quite know the page, but uh, the current position is to have, to have lower taxes because that helps the economy. But they're arguing at the same time that we should have higher taxes in case there is trouble in the economy down the track. I mean, the Labor Party position on tax and on, po on economic policy makes no sense at all. I think you need to go on a retreat and seriously think about it and see what your consensus order, position actually is. Senator, order. Senator, order on my right. And left. Order. I'll call Senator Keneally when I can hear her. Senator Keneally. Thank you. I ask a supplementary question. Former Treasurer Hockey also said, and I quote, We have had the extraordinary situation where the Reserve Bank has cut interest rates to record lows and consumer confidence falls. And why? Because consumers have been spooked. Well, why wouldn't they be? Given the Reserve Bank has cut the cash rate to 1 per cent, is it any wonder consumers are spooked and consumer confidence is falling? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. It is true that uh, on the back of uh, a lot of media reporting, which turned out to be quite misguided, uh, that a lot of Australians were concerned about the possibility of a, a Labor government, uh, which would have had a very negative effect on the economy. They were concerned about the retiree tax and the housing tax, higher taxes on investment and you know, all of the other higher taxes that Labor were pursuing, which is why, of course, they voted for our uh, agenda of lower income taxes for all working Australians, all working Australians. And that is, you know, we, are, we are getting on with the job, we're getting on with delivering what we promised we would deliver to the Australian people to build a stronger economy and secure Australia's future. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Mr Hockey also said, and I quote, if anyone thinks that the Reserve Bank acted today because the economy is doing really well, they'd be deluding themselves. Will the minister admit the economy is facing a crisis, or is he deluding himself? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. President. As I say, our government has got a clear plan to build a stronger economy. It's a plan that was endorsed by the Australian people. It's, and, and you know what? I mean, you know, the Labor Party can continue to uh, you know, persist with the argument they run before the election. We will continue to get on with the job of implementing the plan that the Australian people voted for. Order. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to Senator McKenzie as the Minister for Agriculture. Minister, the Howard government deregulated the dairy industry in the late 1990s. Since then, we have seen Queensland alone go from 1,500 dairy farmers down to approximately 385 and milk production drop from 12 million litres to 9 million litres per year. Yet at the same time, the population has grown from 19 million to 25 million. Deregulation has destroyed a fair farm gate price for milk, with many farms getting less for their milk than cost of production, and farms are now in the hands of foreign ownership exporting milk to their country. Minister, what does the government have planned to ensure the viability of Australian dairy farms so that they receive a fair price for their milk, allowing them to continue in the industry? Senator Mackenzie, the Minister of Agriculture. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Hanson, for your question. Uh, the dairy industry is experiencing difficulties right across the country, not just in your home state of Queensland. I represent Victoria, and we indeed are a great dairying state as well. And that is why our government has taken strong measures to support an industry which underpins so many regional economies around the country. 
Uh, right now, dairy is our third largest rural industry with $4.3 billion farm gate production. And as you've said, uh, with nearly 6,000 dairy farmers, but as you've said, there has been a decrease in leaderage uh, over recent times, and often that is actually as a result of uh, the drought, in particularly in northern Victoria and southern uh, New South Wales, where farmers, I'm sorry, Senator Stirl, farmers are actually having to destock during the drought. That is actually a reality, and that means there is lower literage uh, going through the system. And that is why, going to the election, uh, we sought to assist the dairy industry by giving $10 million to assist dairy farmers to upgrade or invest in energy efficient equipment. One of the issues for the viability and profitability of the dairy industry is the increase of input costs. One of those is electricity. A lot of dairy farmers are irrigators. It is a perishable product, so it must re maintain refrigeration. High energy costs actually impact dairy farmers' profitability because it increases the impost. That's why we're putting money towards reducing their energy costs. We're also uh, funding additional funding to the ACCC to actually establish a dairy specialist in the unit of agriculture within the ACCC to ensure we get the competition policy settings right for the dairy industry. We've also committed to implementing uh, a dairy code, which I know particularly the Queensland dairy farming industry is keen to see uh, occur. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you very much. As I stated, a lot of dairy farms now are in foreign ownership, exporting their milk to other countries. What does the government intend to do to avoid the selling up of dairy farms and the control of the industry to foreign interests? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, we want to see more dairy farmers exporting milk to a whole lot of different foreign countries. It actually underpins so much of our regional communities, our food processing jobs, our yogurt, our milk powder, not just fresh milk and UHT, that go to markets right across the world. So we actually want to increase market access for fabulous clean, green dairy products produced here in Australia. So I don't see the exporting of our product a bad thing and opening of new markets. I think it actually leads to an increase of jobs in regional community and gives our dairy farmers more options of where to actually send their products. And when you have more options, you can have more choice and therefore you can claim a higher price. In terms of foreign ownership, of dairy farms and agricultural land more, more broadly, the National Party and indeed the coalition government, when we first came to power many years ago, implemented change to the FERB arrangements to actually ensure uh, that we have oversight on foreign Order. ownership Senator of agricultural McKenzie. land. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Um, you made a comment about um, dairy farms actually the exporting of milk. What I'm, I understand now is that milk is going to be imported from New Zealand. Now, what why is it left up to the supermarkets to, to collect a levy so that our dairy farmers receive closer to the farm gate value for their milk rather than regulating the industry again that worked previously in the past to ensure that the farmers get a fair price for their milk? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, you know, I think that is 101, fighting for farmers, not just dairy farmers, but producers right across the country and all different commodity groups to get a fair price for their hard work and efforts producing clean, green food. Uh, when you talk about deregulating and regulating the dairy industry, it was indeed the dairy farmers themselves that took that decision uh, to deregulate the dairy industry across Australia. And we've been working through how that has shaken out uh, over the last couple of decades. And yes, there have been issues. Uh, with market power being used by supermarkets in how uh, they actually purchase product and the reward that they give our farmers. And that is why uh, we have committed to the development of a dairy code uh, in conjunction with dairy farmers to ensure that they can have more assurance around uh, a fair price for product. Uh, department officials, my department officials, have visited all eight dairy regions, listening to dairy industry about the development of the code, Order. which will be announced in coming. I'm time has expired. Senator Payne. Um, Mr. President, I know it's uh, unusual in the uh, course of question time, but I seek leave to make a very brief statement to the Le Senate. Leave is granted. Granted, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, uh, following from the Prime Minister's comment, uh, comments in the House of Representatives, uh, I'm very pleased to advise the Senate that uh, young Australian Mr. Alex Sigley has today been released from detention in North Korea. He is safe yeah. and he is well. 
Swedish authorities advised the Australian government that they met with senior officials from the DPRK yesterday and raised the issue of Alex's disappearance on Australia's behalf. Earlier this morning, we were advised that the DPRK had released Alec from detention. He has now safely left the country. Mr President, on behalf of the Australian government, may I express our deepest gratitude to Swedish authorities for their prompt and invaluable assistance in securing Alex's uh, prompt release. The outcome does demonstrate the value of careful, behind-the-scenes, discreet work of officials in resolving complex and sensitive consular cases such as this in close partnership with other governments. I won't be making further comment on this matter out of respect for uh, Alex's privacy and that of his family, but I can say, Mr President, that uh, his father has been advised. Uh, he is enormously relieved and grateful and has asked me to convey um, that the family has asked uh, that we convey the thanks to everyone who has helped and expressed support for them over the past several days. Thank you, Mr yeah. President. I thank the yeah. Senate. Senator Wong. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Senate. I, I, on behalf of the opposition, can I welcome this announcement? Can I share in the Foreign Minister's uh, thanks to the Swedish authorities for their invaluable work in securing uh, Mr. Sikli's release? Uh, I also want to acknowledge the work of all Australian officers, particularly from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, for their work. Uh, as uh, I thank the Minister for her cooperation, the approach the opposition takes on these sensitive co um, consular matters, as you will have seen from public statements, is a bipartisan and cooperative approach. And we're very pleased for Mr. Sikli and his family that this matter has been resolved satisfactorily. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia. Minister, the resources sector is vital to jobs and prosperity in our home state of Queensland. How is the government getting on with the job of delivering for the Australian people through resources sector policy? Senator Kennedy. <coughs> thank you, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator McGrath for his question and recognise his long-standing support for our great well-being resources sector. Mr. President, we on this side of the chamber know how much the mining sector delivers to our country uh, in terms of jobs, in terms of wealth, in terms of prosperity, and that's why we have no shame, Mr. President, and they're never ashamed to defend and support that sector and want to see it grow and back those projects. And Mr. President, this week the figures from my department show that the resources sector has smashed another record that this financial year the resources sector will export the value of $285 billion worth of products on behalf of our nation, smashes the record that was set last financial year at $275 billion. It, the, the, these figures show Mr. President, that over 10 years, every year, the resources sector will be exporting a larger volume of resources uh, for 10 years straight. Every year, a new record being set. The resources sector in this country are delivering more records than the Beatles, Mr. President. They continue to deliver year on year on year for our country, and that's why we support them. We didn't need, Mr. President, we didn't need uh, uh, the Australian people to give us a spanking at the election to remind us about how important the mining sector is. I notice now there's a number of people. There's more people here in this parliament uh, since we were here last time supporting the resources sector, That's supporting right. coal mining. and That is fantastic, Mr President. I, am so, uh, well, so I welcome so much the result of that election. Isn't it amazing, though, that it has taken, uh, uh, taken 15 million odd Australians to have their say for the Australian Labor Party to realise that maybe, just maybe, maybe, the mining sector might be important to our country's wealth, prosperity and people's livelihoods. We don't need uh, to have that result, Mr President, because we live in these regions. We work in these regions. We talk to people who wear orange, yellow and pink fluoro colours. We know what their lives mean, and that's why we support and back them, Mr President. That's why we support the opening up of the Galilee Basin. That's why we support the opening of the Browse Basin in West Australia. That's why we support the continuing development of resource markets right around the world. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. What can governments do to make sure mining resources continue to generate wealth and jobs for Australians in the future? Senator Canavan. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, one concerning thing around the figures that were released this week is that that record-breaking run I mentioned uh, is about to plateau and uh, would likely, in the next three to five years, possibly start declining. So we won't be exporting more volumes every year, year on year. Because, Mr. President, we have been relying on the significant investments that were made over the last decade during the mining boom, and of course, unless new investments are made year on year, eventually uh, you start to decline in terms of the production. 
So we have had a production boom, an investment boom, followed by a production boom. What we need to do is now support new investments in resources. We need to make sure that we don't have nine-year delays on projects like the Queensland Government has presided over on the Adani Carmichael coal mine. Good that that's going on now, but the Queensland Government is now ranked, Mr President, in the Fraser Institute rankings on uncertainty of environmental regulation. They are ranked 49th out of 83 jurisdictions in the world. They're behind Russia, PNG, and Congo. That's why we're leading a charge in COAG to do benchmarking on environmental regulation around the mining sector to make sure we facilitate investments in mining, Order. not put Senator more hurdles Kennedy. in front of them. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. What would be the consequences of failing to take advantage of Australia's natural resources? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, Mr. President, the consequences would be felt by people. They'd be felt by people who largely live in smaller towns and country areas of, of our nation. Uh, not only in those towns, though, uh, Brisbane and Perth are the biggest mining towns in our nation, uh, where hundreds of thousands of people rely on the sector for their jobs. But you know, I, I, I very much uh, keep in front of my mind people like Kel Appleton, a publican at Claremont. Uh, who has said that the opening up the Galilee in central Queensland is in, he's, he's quoting him. He says it's our chance to have the things city people take for granted, things like a strong, stable income and hope for your children. Uh, all the words of Anne Baker, who's a, who's a proud member of the Labor Party, the mayor of the Isaac Shire, Shire who we're caught up with recently. She says she wrote a few months ago that the Galilee Basin would help fund schools, hospitals and public services, not only across our state but also across this country. And with that in mind, she added that can all levels of government afford for the Galilee Basin not to open? Mr. President, these are the people that are at the front of our minds and we seek to support the resource sector so they can have a better future for their children and we can make our country a stronger place. Before I come to the next question, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber and gallery of a parliamentary delegation from Fiji led by the honourable Ayers Syed Kayum. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to the Senate. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Minister Birmingham, representing the Minister for Education. Minister, in the last three years, your government has slashed the repayment threshold for study loans by nearly 20 per cent, in effect cutting the pay of low-income workers. Just this week, the government slugged another 136,000 Australians by cutting the threshold by another $6,000. How does the government justify giving tax cuts to millionaires while they punish low-income workers for studying? The Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Birmingham. Well, I th thank you, Mr President. I thank the Senator for her question. Uh, of course, uh, I'd make the point in her question uh, that, firstly, uh, Senator, uh, you need to appreciate, of course, that students who leave university uh, and get jobs or leave other forms of study that they leave with the student debt and get jobs uh, are students who then go on and pay taxes. And those students will benefit from there being lower taxes. And they'll have those benefits long after they've repaid their student loans. And those benefits will help them through their lives uh, to be able uh, to buy their homes, to establish themselves, uh, to save for their retirement, to support their families, to pursue all of those sorts of things that you expect graduates to seek to do. In relation to the HELP scheme itself, to our student loan scheme, that, Mr President, as this chamber, I think, should know and should acknowledge, is one of the most generous schemes in the world. It's one of the most generous schemes in the world that allows Australians to go to university for an undergraduate degree and face no upfront fees whatsoever, to take on a loan that has no real interest rate whatsoever, no additional fees whatsoever attached to it, and then to only pay that back at reasonable income levels. What this government did, yes, uh, the Senator is right, is lower the starting threshold, but we also implemented a newer, lower first repayment rate too. Uh, and so there is a new 1 per cent repayment rate uh, that, from memory, uh, uh, Mr President, it's a little while since I knew all of these statistics <laughs> off by heart, uh, but from memory equates to around $8 a week. Uh, in terms of repayment uh, of student loans for those who first reach that threshold. We did also make sure that for graduates earning higher incomes, they repay their loans faster by putting in place yeah. higher repayment rates at higher incomes, because that's the way you sustain the most generous student loan scheme in the world. Yeah. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, every single person the government has targeted by these unfair changes to study loans is a low-income worker who already faces low wages, growing underemployment and the increasing cost of living. 
So how can you claim, how can the government claim to support low-income earners when you've just slugged 136,000 of, of them with additional unfair forced repayments? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, obviously, the perils, of course, and there are many new senators in the chamber. The perils when you uh, have your supplementary question already written and you don't change it or vary it when you hear the answer. Uh, I'll repeat again for the senator's interest. I repeat again for the senator's interest that one of our reforms was to put in place higher repayment yeah. thresholds yeah. and higher repayment rates at high income thresholds. So, in fact, one of our reforms is there is now a 10% repayment rate for those earning more than $134,573. So those who leave study and get jobs that are well paid will absolutely be repaying their loans back much faster than they would have in the past. And that is good news in terms of the sustainability of our student loan scheme, which has billions of dollars uh, of debt that the government carries on behalf of students, but we want to make sure that we can continue to offer on incredibly generous terms. And yes, in terms of lower incomes, there is that new 1% threshold that kicks in at $45,881. Order, Senator Birmingham. Per. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Minister, isn't this yet just another blatant cash grab by the government from those who can least afford it? Will you just admit that your government doesn't give a damn about students or low-income workers and that the only people that you care about is your millionaire mates. Senator Birmingham. Yeah, all <laughs> well, Order. Mr. President, it may uh, come as no surprise to the chamber. I'm not going to admit any of the things that Senator Faruqi has invited me to admit. Uh, I will acknowledge, however, that uh, the Australian Greens don't give a damn about how it is you manage money at all. Uh, that the Australian Greens don't give a damn about whether or not uh, the debt book is sustainable for our student loan scheme or anything else, because they think that money just grows on trees. The Australian Greens seem to think that money just go, grows on trees. trees. What our government will do, Mr President, has done is make sure that we can, as a country, continue to afford to provide the most generous access to university and to study options without upfront fees for those students, and we preserve and maintain that by making sure that we have a student loan scheme where the bulk of those funds are repaid so that it is sustainable for generations into the future. That's who we're looking after. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. I refer to breaking reports from The Australian that Centre Alliance has received a written guarantee outlining the Morrison government's gas policy. Does the written guarantee provide a guarantee that the price of gas will be reduced to $7 a gigajoule, as promised this morning by Senator Patrick? If so, will the minister be up front with the Senate and undertake to table a copy of the written guarantee in this place? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I think it's always prudent not to believe everything you read in the newspaper. It's not always, not always, it's always prudent not to believe everything that you read in the newspaper. Um, as I, I would, I would oh, sorry, refer. Can you Sorry, I would, thank you. I would, I would refer you to uh, my consistent statements uh, in recent weeks uh, when I've always made the point that, of course, we're prepared to engage constructively with those uh, non-government senators who want to engage with us in relation to policy issues of concern to them and their constituents. And it's a matter of public record that we've sat down, Senator Canavan and I, we sat down in Perth uh, with uh, Senator Patrick and we went in some detail uh, explaining the uh, policy positions that we've adopted in the past to help uh, bring down the uh, price Senator of gas. Foreman, in the Senator Australia. Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt. On relevance, Mr. President, we've let Senator Coleman go for some time, but he hasn't addressed uh, this statement from Senator Patrick that there is a written guarantee. That's what we want to know about, and that's what we want him to table. I'm listening very carefully to the minister. I cannot instruct him how to answer a question or to the, or, or to the content of it, as long as it is being directly relevant to a question or its terms. I believe at this stage Mr. Uh, Senator Cormann is being directly relevant. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, it's a matter of public record uh, that uh, we have uh, engaged constructively uh, with uh, centre line senators uh, in relation to the government's long standing commitment uh, to bring down the price of electricity and to continue to bring down uh, the price of gas uh, into, the, into the domestic market. Uh, you know, I, I can't even, I'm, I'm not even Order. allowed to answer the question. Uh, today is a day for the Senate to deal with income tax cuts. 
Uh, of course, the government will continue to work with all senators prepared to engage with us constructively on other policy matters. And as the government has made relevant decisions, the relevant announcements will be made. Senator Watt, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll make this supplementary question very simple for Senator Cormann. Is there a written guarantee that gas prices will fall, as has been promised by Senator Patrick? Senator Cormann. Well, again, I let Senator Patrick talk for himself. The only, the only guarantee that the government, Order. the only guarantee the government is providing, is that we will we will deliver income tax relief for millions of Australians. We will deliver income tax relief for millions of Australians, and we will continue to work in good faith and constructively uh, to pursue order. the government's Senator long Cormann, Senator Watt, on a point of order. Mr. Mr. President, again, Senator Cormann is not answering the question which is very simple. Is there a written guarantee? It's a yes or no question. Uh, I can't instruct the minister how to answer the question. The question, however, was about gas rather than other elements of policy. Um, so you've reminded the minister of the question. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as I've indicated uh, to the Senate, uh, the government is very grateful uh, that Senators uh, Patrick, uh, Lambie, Griff and Bernardi are supporting our plan for lower income taxes for all working Australians, as endorsed by the Australian people at the last election. And we will continue to work in good faith and constructively uh, with uh, non-government senators who want to engage with us around measures to bring down the cost of electricity and to boost domestic supplies of gas into our domestic market. Senator Watt, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. We can only assume that the answer is no, based on Senator Cormann's previous answers. But Senator Cormann has ruled out doing any special deals in order to legislate the government's tax package. Given it's clear the minister has in fact done special deals, isn't it clear that his word is worth just as much as his guaranteed support for former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I can confirm that there are no special deals. There are absolutely no special deals. What we are doing, and as I've, what we have said, what we have said consistently, what we have said consistently, is that we would work with non-government senators in relation to public policy, public policy issues, public policy issues, public policy issues, and we are seeking, we are seeking to secure alignment. We are seeking to secure alignment with non-government senators around important public policy priorities and indeed the government has got a long-standing policy priority to uh, deliver lower electricity prices lower gas prices and we will and we will continue we will continue to work with uh, senators in relation to these matters but these decisions have to stand on their own merit they've got to be taken on their own merit and they will continue to be taken on their own merit senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Minister, how is the government getting on with delivering for the Australian people by helping Australian businesses benefit from trade, tour tourism and investment opportunities with our G20 partners? And how does this help to create a stronger economy that guarantees the essential services that Australians rely on? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Fawcett for, uh, for his question, and I know his very deep uh, interest and indeed knowledge, of course, in, uh, in all matters of trade, foreign policy, and, uh, and defence. And I'm pleased to inform Senator Fawcett and the Senate uh, that Prime Minister Morrison, uh, in at the recent G20 meetings of leaders in uh, Osaka in Japan, delivered strong messages to the G20 about uh, the importance of maintaining and modernising a consistent, rules based, framework to facilitate trade and investment flow uh, between Australia and other nations, but indeed right across the globe. And this is critically important because one in five Australian jobs are trade-related. Indeed, 2.2 million Australian jobs depend upon our trade relationships and trade activities as a nation. Uh, and trade growth has been a engine, an engine behind the type of jobs growth that Australia has seen that Senator Cash was speaking about at the commencement of question time. Indeed, one quarter of Australia's economic growth over the last five years is estimated to be attributable to our growth in trade and export activity. Uh, trading companies pay higher wages, an estimated 11.5 per cent higher wages amongst those companies and businesses who export. Household incomes are an estimated $8,400 higher 
due to the type of trade liberalisation and opening up of markets that Australia has undertaken. And other nations are great beneficiaries of more open market environments, and we have seen that with hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty through our region in the Indo-Pacific and particularly in Asia as a result of more open markets. And Australia is committed, whether it is with large trading partners like China or indeed smaller but no less important trading partners like our friends from Fiji who are in the chamber at present, to make sure that we continue to advance, as the Prime Minister did at the G20, the agenda for open trading arrangements. Order. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Will the minister inform the Senate about the key outcomes for Australia that were advanced through the meetings that were conducted at the G20 summit? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, first and foremost, uh, the Prime Minister worked hard uh, with colleagues and particularly with the support and on behalf of uh, the Government of New Zealand uh, to make sure that the G20 commitment for global action on preventing terrorist and violent extremist content online uh, was delivered uh, with a clear message sent to internet companies to lift their efforts to ensure their platforms are not exploited, uh, to make sure that there is tough action taken as we have done in our domestic laws in Australia uh, to ensure that Australians and those around the world are protected uh, from viewing and seeing the types of horrific events that occurred in Christchurch. But we also saw in relation to the trade front uh, strong work in relation to the Osaka track uh, that was launched by Japan, which complements the e-commerce negotiations we're pursuing and leading uh, through the World Trade Organisation to modernise trade rules and to ensure they reflect uh, modern trading arrangements, as well as direct pursuit uh, of trade negotiations with the European Union, uh, with our ASEP Order. counterparts and Senator with our other Birmingham. major trading Senator partners. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Minister, how will our broader international efforts to grow Australian trade create more jobs and a stronger economy without raising taxes? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, opening up our trade markets, as our government has consistently done over the last six years with our trade agreements struck with China, Japan, the Republic of Korea, the TPP and continuing to build on other partnerships, is paying and delivering dividends for Australia. Just yesterday, the Australian Bureau of Statistics released data that showed that Australia had recorded a record trade surplus for the month of May this year of some $5.7 billion. That record trade surplus is fuelled by record levels of exports from Australia. And indeed, the five largest monthly trade surpluses ever recorded in Australian history have all been delivered in 2019. This is a demonstration that, as a country, we are yielding benefits of growing exports into markets, particularly where we have trade agreements in place. And that growth in exports is fuelling business growth, jobs growth, fuelling the opportunity for us to see revenue growth, which ultimately allows us to balance a budget and pay for tax cuts and tax relief Order. for hard-working Senator Australians. Birmingham. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Former Minister for Defence Christopher Pine announced he had taken a position with EY, stating that he was, and I quote, looking forward to providing strategic advice to Ernst & Young as the firm looks forward to expanding its footprint in the defence industry. In response, the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham, warned that, and I quote, everybody should adhere to that code of conduct, and that includes Christopher. I note the statement made by Minister Cormann to the Senate earlier today. When did the Prime Minister invite his secretary, write to his secretary asking him to investigate Mr Pline's employment with Ernst & Young? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, as uh, Senator uh, Kitchen uh, uh, quite rightly uh, outlines, the Prime Minister has written uh, to um, Dr Parkinson uh, in the terms as I've advised the Chamber uh, earlier, I'll get the precise. Uh, in fact, he's written to him on the 3rd of July. Senator Kitching, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abetz has said that, and I quote, people do expect a standard from the ministers and then former ministers to ensure that which, that which they have learned and gleaned from their ministerial roles are not exported into other roles from which they can potentially gain financially. Has the Prime Minister or his office discussed Mr Pine's employment with EY with Mr Pine? 
If so, when and with whom did the discussion take place? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I'm aware of a public statement that uh, former Minister Payne uh, issued uh, in relation to some of these other matters. I take them on notice. Uh, but as I've indicated to the Senate, uh, the Prime Minister has written to Dr. Parkinson uh, seeking advice on these matters uh, as appropriate. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, as I've indicated to the Chamber, we'll provide an update on these matters in due course. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Liberal member for Barkin, Tony pa Passon, has said that, and I quote, what I do know is the fact we're talking about is indicative that it just doesn't pass the pub test. While the Prime Minister's secretary is investigating Mr Pine's employment with Ernst & Young, what arrangements are in place to ensure Mr Pine does not take advantage of information obtained due to his former ministerial responsibilities? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, there is absolutely no indication that uh, uh, former Minister Payne uh, is or has or is acting uh, in breach of the Statement of Ministerial Standards, but the Prime Minister uh, has uh, sought advice in relation to these matters, as I've indicated to the Chamber. Uh, and, uh, order. No, Senator Cormann. Senator Kitching on a point of order. My question was not whether there had been or had been a breach. My question was in relation to what arrangements are in place to ensure that there uh, isn't yeah, one. I cannot instruct the Minister how to answer the question. He's been speaking for 18 seconds. I consider him directly relevant, but I'm listening. Senator Cormann. Uh, well, as I've indicated to the Chamber, the Prime Minister sought advice from Dr Parkinson and uh, you know, we'll pro I'll provide an update at the appropriate time. And uh, with that, uh, I ask that further questions be placed on a notice paper. Uh, Senator Wong. I seek leave to move a motion uh, requiring a minister to table a document. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. To contingent notice, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion requiring a minister to table a document. The document in question is the document which sets out the deal with Central Alliance uh, on gas prices about which questions have been asked in this chamber today. And let us be very clear, let us be very clear, both in the House of Representatives when Mr Taylor was asked questions and today and today in the Senate, uh, when the leader of the government in the Senate was asked questions, there was an utter, an utter refusal by the government to give any details of this special deal, this special deal with Centre Alliance. Uh, uh, that is a deal that, Ms. that Senator Patrick has been very clear and upfront with the newspapers that he has achieved in return for his vote on the tax cuts. And I just would remind the government that Mr. Senator, S Senator Patrick has said to newspapers that his party has received a written guarantee outlining the Morrison government's gas policy, which the key, the key minor party demanded in exchange for its support for the $158 billion worth personal income tax cuts package. Uh, the draft gas policy signed by the government was given to Central Alliance senators last night ahead of a crucial vote in the Senate today on tax cuts. Well, I think the Australian people and this Senate are entitled to see a copy of a gas policy which is supposed to deliver, as Senator Patrick asserts, $7 per gigajoule, which is supposed to deliver uh, lower prices to consumers, uh, which is supposed to deliver uh, uh, gas prices uh, in South Australia that are lower uh, and which the government is, is keeping secret. Well, I think the, the Australian people and this chamber are entitled to see the detail of this secret deal. Senator Patrick is out there spruiking it to the newspapers. Minister Taylor and Minister Cormann in the House of Representatives and the Senate, respectively, are, are dancing around the qu answers and refusing to provide answers on this question. Now, I also want to make this point to Centre Alliance and to Senator Patrick. Senator Rex Patrick, Senator Griff, uh, I hope you come in here and, consistent with your party platform around transparency and accountability, vote for this suspension of standing orders so as to enable the document to be tabled. Because uh, Centre Alliance's uh, public platform is they believe in transparent and accountable government. I think it's pretty reasonable for a party that believes in transparent and, ca and accountable government to require a government to tell the Australian people what their policy is. I think that's pretty reasonable. That's pretty transparent, pretty accountable. And the second point I'd make, and this is a point about the ethics of it, 
Centre Alliance has made clear, and they're entitled to do this, they've done an, made an agreement with the government to vote for the tax package. Uh, we don't agree with stage three. We've explained why. We, we agree with stages one and two, but not stage three, and we've explained our position. But if the Centre Alliance party has traded their votes for a policy, I think it is incumbent upon them to outline what that policy right. is. It is incumbent upon them to outline what this policy is. So I look forward to Senator Patrick and Senator Griff coming in here and voting with the Australian Labor Party and I hope other parties in this place to require the government to table the document that Centre Alliance is talking to the media about. I mean, this is the extraordinary thing. The document that Senator Cormann doesn't want to acknowledge the existence of, that he doesn't want to ask questions about, that he has ducked and weaved on throughout the entirety of question time today. Well, Senator Patrick has been out there chatting to the media. So it's fine. We've got the media saying, oh, this is what's in the document, but the Senate can't see it. The Senate can't see it and the Australian people can't see it. We just get Senator Patrick spruiking his deal. Well, if it's such a great deal, if it's such a great deal, I'm sure Senator Patrick and Senator Griff will vote for this motion to ensure uh, that the government actually tables the document. That is government policy. That is government policy. Because what has occurred, what has occurred is a deal has been done about government policy, and you ought to front up to the Senate, Senator Cormann, and tell people what the policy actually is. You ought to front up to the Senate and tell them what you're doing in order to get these votes. Uh, you're the one that said no special deals. You're the one that said no special deals. Well, you're given a special deal. Now, that's fine. It's up to you if you want to do that. But I think it is incumbent upon the government and Centre Alliance to provide to this Senate and via the Senate, the Australian people, the details of the gas policy, the gas policy changes that you have agreed in order to get their votes. Now, this document is out there. This document has been signed by, gov by government. This document is being spruiked by, the, by, by Senator Patrick as the thing he got for his vote. Well, table the document. Front up and table the document. It's the right thing to do. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Firstly, uh, Senator Patrick has advised me that the uh, story uh, that is written by Rosie Lewis is incorrect, and no doubt he will explain uh, himself. No doubt he will explain that to the chamber at the appropriate time. Furthermore, I mean, th there is there is absolutely there's absolutely nothing. There's no stone that the Labor Party would leave unturned in order to prevent Australians from getting a tax cut. There is no stone that the Labor Party will leave unturned to prevent working Australians getting, keeping more of their own money in their pocket. You know what? Centre Alliance and Senator Lambie have made a decision to support good policy, policy which was endorsed by the Australian people, policy which is important to strengthen our economy and policy, of course, which the Senate should support. I would just refer Senator uh, Wong to uh, what I've said consistently uh, on the record for some time, and I, I refer you in particular to a Sky interview on the 14th of June, and, and it's, it, sums up, it sums up our approach. We will continue to engage in good faith uh, and constructively with all non-government senators a range of issues have been raised, ranging from a desire uh, to uh, lower energy prices, which we share and we are pursuing, and various other issues. It is very important for your viewers to understand our government is absolutely committed to lower energy prices. We have a very ambitious agenda already to bring down energy prices, including by boosting supply of gas into the domestic market. Of course, we are prepared to engage with non-government senators in relation to these matters. In the end, you have to make judgments on these matters on their own merit. Now, that is, that is the important point. So we are here today pursuing a policy uh, to reduce income taxes for all working Australians, and that is a policy that we commend uh, to the Senate on its own merits, because it's an important economic policy, it's, an, it's economically necessary, fiscally responsible, and is what the Australian people voted for. Furthermore, though, we have a long-standing commitment to bring electricity prices down. We have a long-standing track record of uh, pursuing policy measures to drive down the cost of electricity, drive down the cost of gas, to boost the supply of gas into the domestic market, in particular on the, on the um, East Coast. That is, that is not a secret. Of course, we have been engaging uh, with uh, Centre Alliance in relation to these matters, and we have committed to continue to work with them in good faith, and as, as positions have been finalised and as processes uh, have been put in place, of course we will announce all of these matters, as is appropriate, but here's the important point. We are working with 
all senators who are prepared to work with us on finding consensus in alignment with the government's policy agenda. We already have a long-standing <laughs> policy agenda to drive down energy prices. That is well and truly understood. It's well and truly on the public record. And when we're in a position to make further announcements about further policy initiatives uh, in the future, of course, we will do that at the appropriate time. But this is, this is nothing but the Labour Party trying to uh, prevent the, the Parliament, trying to prevent the Senate uh, from dealing uh, with um, important legislation to deliver income tax relief to all working Australians. I think that everyone can see through what this is about. Uh, I think the Senate just, just, should just get on with it, should deal with the uh, legislation that's in front of us, deal with the amendments, uh, and uh, make sure that by the end of next week, work, millions of working Australians, millions of working Australians uh, can get, keep more of their own money in their own pockets. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, well, this story about what kind of a deal has been done between the government and Senator Alliance just continues unravelling by the minute. Uh, the latest comments that we've just heard from Senator Cormann are that Senator Patrick has now retracted his claims that he has a written guarantee from the government. So. Senator Gorman, Senator, exactly. Senator Cormann has clearly been on the phone or had his people on the phone heavying Senator Patrick, saying, oh, you better get out there, Rex, and retract that story, because you remember the hush-hush, we've got no written guarantee. So if, if Senator Cormann is now to be believed, and in fact there isn't a written guarantee from the government about gas prices, are we to believe that Senator Alliance actually hasn't got any kind of a deal in order for supporting these tax cuts? They either have a deal or they don't. It's either in writing or it's not, but from what we're hearing from Senator Cormann, there is no written guarantee, there is no deal. So what is Senator Alliance actually doing here? We can't ask them because they've been hiding for the entirety of question time, too ashamed to come to this chamber as their hopeless deal is being exposed. Uh, and now we learn that it appears, according to Senator Cormann, that there's no deal whatsoever. So I, I have to say, I am thoroughly confused about what Senator Alliance are up to and what they are going to get out of this deal for the Australian people. I mean, one of the reasons I'm confused is that I heard Senator Patrick on AM this morning being interviewed by Sabra Lane, and he was dodging and weaving about her questions about what effect this would actually have on gas prices, but she finally managed to pin him down when she asked, so people on the East Coast, including South Australia, can expect that their prices will be $4 cheaper in 12 months or so? Senator Patrick, I think probably a realistic measure is something of the order of about $7 per gigajoule. Currently, we're paying about $9 per gigajoule. So Senator Patrick has been in the media this morning making a promise that gas prices on the East Coast are going to fall by $2 per gigajoule, which means that households using their gas appliances in South Australia, in Queensland, in North New South Wales, Victoria, uh, other states and territories on the, on the East Coast will get a gas price reduction. But now we're starting to find out that, in fact, there's no such deal. So, I mean, what, can someone just tell us what Centre Alliance is actually getting out of this? They're about to sign up to, they're signing up to tax cuts from this government, which are going to remove $158 billion in revenue from the federal budget over the next few years. They're, they're, they're about to give away $158 billion of public money that is needed to fund all sorts of other services in their home state of South Australia. And while I would disagree with them doing a deal that might do something about gas prices, now we're finding out that they actually don't even have a deal. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing Senator Alliance over the course of the day try to explain to us and to the South Australians who voted for them, what on earth they have managed to get out of the government in return for rolling over and backing in $158 billion of tax cuts. I mean, the article that we're referring to is crystal clear that uh, it was published around question time. Centre Alliance has received a written guarantee outlining the Morrison government's gas policy, which the key minor party demanded in exchange for its support for the tax cuts. A copy of the draft gas policy which has been signed by the government, was given to Centre Alliance senators last night ahead of a crucial vote in the Senate today. I mean, that's not something you make up. 
There's clearly a draft gas policy. Senator Canavan's here. He can probably illuminate us about this. He was probably involved in drafting this gas policy. He's also party to this deal, and he's, he's, by, by forming this deal, he is also promising people in his home state of Queensland that their gas prices are going to fall. $9 a gigajoule down to $7 a gigajoule. So I look forward to all those people in Rockhampton thanking Senator Canavan for the gas price reductions that he's promised them. And oh, here's Senator Patrick. Now he can maybe tell us. Senator Patrick, have you done a deal or have you haven't? Have you, have you done a written deal or have you not? Have you done a verbal deal or have you not? Because we were told that you had, and now we're being told that you haven't. So we'd quite like to know what you've done. I mean, you're about to give away $158 billion in tax cuts. No, no. What I'm, what I'm interested in knowing, what I'm interested in knowing, is what anyone is getting for this. So you're not. So there's no guarantees. There's no Order, guarantees about Senator, gas prices. What you should time, think about that. Time has expired. Order. Se order. Order. I'll call Senator Patrick when there is order. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. I have heard uh, what's been said in the chamber over the last uh, um, 10 or 15 minutes. I'll just explain to you what, uh, what has happened. Um, uh, Senator Cormann came down to Adelaide a, a few weeks ago, had a bit of a chat. Had, Order. A, had a bit of a chat to us about uh, things that would be of, that were of concern to us. We raised a number of issues, one of which was energy prices. That won't be surprising to Senator Wong. She knows that uh, uh, electricity prices in South Australia are the highest in the country. Um, Senator Cormann then invited me to come across to Western Australia to sit down with Senator Canavan, uh, which we did, and we started talking about uh, uh, ways in which uh, uh, gas prices in this country could be brought down. Now, Senator Canavan brought a whole range of things to the table that he was already working on. We talked about a number of things. Order. We talked about a number of things that uh, uh, that we thought were, would be useful. Uh, we've had a dialogue backwards and forwards. It turns out some of the things that we thought might be useful are not uh, can't be implemented because they're not, it wouldn't be lawful to do so. Or uh, some of the things that we've asked to uh, that we suggested be done can't technically be achieved. They don't actually give you the outcome that you want. So we've had a running dialogue with the, with the government over the last uh, three or four weeks um, and uh, going backwards and forwards, having conversations about, uh, about the details. Now, at the moment, the, the status, and I, I'm sure Senator Cormann will confirm this, they have a draft outline of how they want to approach things. It's not fully developed. Uh, in, it would, and as, Pen as Senator Wong would know, uh, as Senator Wong would know, uh, having been a minister in government, uh, tabling something or, or uh, producing something that is that is uh, not completed can actually be harmful because the, the government is still working through a whole range of options, uh, and they need to do a whole bunch of uh, checking off on those options. So we have an understanding of where they want to go. And we also have an, invit we also have an Senator, invitation. Senator Patrick, please stop the clock. Resume your seat. Point of order, Senator Wong. Point of order. I'd ask that Senator Patrick advise the Senate whether or not he has received a written guarantee. That's not a point of not, not, not a point of order, Senator Wong. Senator Patrick, please continue. So, Senate, um, Senator Cormann uh, has given it order. I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. Stop into, so order. If you stop into left, I'll order. come to it. Senator, Senator Cormann has invited us to continue talking with him on this policy issue and indeed on other policy issues. And that's how uh, the crossbench can work well with, with government. Uh, okay? I can tell you I do not have a document that links anything to tax cuts. It doesn't, it doesn't set a price. Uh, the price that I mentioned this morning on, on, uh, on ABC is no what I mentioned uh, as a name Order point. On my left. As I as a name point is the price that A Triple C uh, Chairman Rod Sims has suggested we can get to in terms of gas pricing. Okay, there is no agreement that says if you vote for the tax cuts we will do this. There's an you know, the, or, order because we're now Senator quite satisfied. So we're now quite satisfied the government is moving in a really good direction in relation to gas gas prices. Okay, so that is. 
that, that's, that's the status of things. There is no written agreement that says we're going to, you do this and we will support tax cuts. I can absolutely assure you of that. Uh, there is a, a dialogue that's taken place. There's been emails exchanged. There, there, there are, there's a draft policy document. But that, uh, once again, it would be irresponsible to, to, to table something that is in draft that is not fully considered. Thank you. Senator Canavan. President, and uh, Mr. President, just commenting on some other contributions on this uh, debate of a, a need to suspend standing orders, I, I noted that Senator Watt a number of times, Mr. President, used the word confused. He was confused about how things are going and where things are, are at. And I, I can understand. I, I think I can, I can understand uh, Senator Watt's confusion, Mr. President, because my understanding, Mr. President, of where the Australian Labor Party are with the tax cuts legislation is that their position on how they're going to vote this evening on tax cuts is going to be determined by wherever the Centre Alliance and other crossbenchers come to. So the once proud Australian Labor Party here you would think maybe would have a position themselves on something as important as uh, large income tax cuts to help stimulate the economy and return uh, wealth to the Australian people. You'd think they might have their own policy on that position, given the, the nature of their party and their dreams one day to, to be in government. But instead, Mr. President, you have this absurd situation where they're going to hold a shadow cabinet minutes meeting this afternoon, apparently, after uh, Mr. Senator Patrick and uh, Senators Griff and uh, Senator Lambie and others come to a position. And then they'll determine what their position is. Now, I've got great respect, Mr. President, for Senator Patrick and Senator Alliance and, and other senators in this place. Senator but I cannot what? understand, Mr. President, why the once proud Australian Labor Party is outsourcing their policy development to a couple of senators in South Australia. How low has the Australian Labor Party dropped to, Mr. President, that that is the state of affairs that we are now seeing, Mr. President? This suspension order, this suspension motion, Mr. President, has nothing to do with policy. It has nothing to do with transparency. It has nothing to do with good government, Mr. President. This motion is just a way for the Australian Labor Party to prevent and stop Australians having tax cuts. That's what they are trying to do this afternoon. Order they are Senator trying to Wall. delay, having to come to a position themselves, trying to delay how, how Australians getting the benefit of a tax cut, Mr President. And that's why this suspension motion should be rejected, Mr President, because we should deal with these matters that are important, that were uh, central to the recent federal election campaign. Uh, we should get back to the job of dealing with those and those substantive matters right now. Mr President, um, as I have said in the last couple of weeks, the Australian government take seriously the need uh, to have competitive gas prices in this country and to do so in a way which continues to attract investment in gas supply. Mr. President, we have, uh, in my view, in the last couple of years approached this important matter in a considered and diligent fashion. We have also done so in a collaborative way with all stakeholders, with the users of gas in this country, many conversations and meetings with gas users, the manufacturing users of Australia, uh, uh, the Energy Users Association of Australia, as well as uh, gas producers <coughs> as well. Uh, and that approach has led, Mr. President, to in the last two years, gas prices, wholesale gas prices, have fallen by 20 uh, per cent. We've gone from a situation two years ago where the Queensland coal seam gas industry was barely supplying gas for a few months to the rest of Australia in, in net terms, uh, to today, Queensland coal seam gas supplying 25 per cent of the East Coast market, uh, over 100 petajoules a year. It's been a very good outcome for our gas markets. It's provided a lot of gas into the system albeit I recognise that our prices are still much higher than they were before, Mr President. And on that front, we, 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 the two years ago, when, sorry, sorry, six years ago, when, when the trains and, and Gladstone started to be built and constructed, when the Australian Labor Party were in government, no one, no one, no one looked at whether or not uh, building six trains in Gladstone and establishing a massive gas industry, a gas export industry, would have and what effect that would have on the domestic market. No one looked at this. In the, in, the, in the time since uh, the Shadow Energy Minister of the Labor Party, Mark Butler, said that everybody knew at the time gas prices would go up, yet they still did nothing back in 2012 when they approved these projects. Now, Mr President, we don't want to see that happen again. That's why we have been the first government to put in place export gas controls. We've done so in a methodical way, as I've said. We've done so in a way that will continue to make any developments in this area in that fashion. What we won't do is the kind of ad hoc response the Australian Labor Party is adopting. They've had, Mr. President, in the last two weeks, the Australian Labor Party had three different positions on gas. Two weeks ago, uh, their shadow minister for resources, Joel Fitzgibbon, told Fran Kelly on Radio National that 
We want a bipartisan approach to this. It's too important for politics. We want to be part of the solution, not part of the problems. I've already had discussions with Matt Canada on this issue, and we need to together, work together to get it right. I agree and support those sentiments. Then today I come to the chamber and Senator Pratt moves a motion to trigger gas export controls today. Do it today. That's not exactly bipartisan. That's completely inconsistent with your own shadow minister. You're a complete and utter rabble. And then also today, Matt Keogh, uh, you're a member for BERT, uh, said on Sky News when he was asked about gas triggers and gas reservation, he said, I think it's a concern. We want to see the detail of this because I don't want to see the government doing it. It creates a sovereign risk. And then his own senator comes in here from Western Australia and moves a motion to create sovereign risk. It is an absolute rabble of the Australian Labor Party, Mr President, and that is why we should deny this motion. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. Well, what a performance we had there from Senator Patrick. He likes to have two middle names that he's built his reputation on, transparency and accountability. Well, that has completely gone out the window here today. His performance of how he's come in here to try and justify this was completely lacklustre, absolutely lacklustre. So never again will the Labor Party be lectured to by Senator Patrick on transparency and accountability. He's the one who's done the deal and he's the one who's refusing to explain it and we will absolutely hold him to account because there's bigger things at stake here. There's the tax cuts which we are expected to vote on today. Uh, we know that they are worth $158 billion. So the Senate are expected to vote on that today, and we don't know what you, deal you've done. Uh, and this is more than just the tax cuts, because whatever deal you've done will have an impact on policy across Australia, and particularly in my home state of Queensland. So it is absolutely unacceptable that you do some sort of deal and then you don't actually come in here and explain it. And it's absolutely reprehensible that Senator Kenavan hasn't explained it to the people of Queensland as well. Uh, because we know in Queensland that these sorts of things around gas have a significant impact. And the only state that's actually done anything about gas prices over the last couple of years has been Queensland. None of what Senator Kenavan has talked about has actually had an impact. It's been the Queensland government that's actually been delivering and ensuring that producers in Queensland have the gas that they need. No better example of that than Incitec Pivot. Senator Canavan didn't have a role in that, but it was the Queensland government that was making sure that there was new gas being um, provided so that those workers could be looked after at Incitec Pivot. The Queensland Labor government, Canavan was absolutely missing when it came to that. But we also know that when it comes to Senator Cormann, and when I got into work today, I was in a bit of a bad mood, so to get some cheering up, I put on Sky News, which always gives me a bit of a boost. And there I heard Senator Cormann uh, talking about uh, his arrangement with the crossbenchers, saying he had no deals. Uh, and I heard him talk about it in relation to Senator Lambie. I heard him talk about it in relation to the Senate Alliance. But as we know um, from previous experience, and former Prime Minister Turnbull learnt this the hard way, um, Senator Cormann is always doing things behind the scenes. And there's no doubt that he's come to an arrangement here uh, with Senator Griff. Uh, we know that there's a pretty cosy relationship between their officers, but they are not being upfront with the Australian people, and that is of a concern from particularly for me in Queensland, because I know this does have an impact in that area. Uh, so what we need to know is the impact that this will have on Queensland, uh, what sort of arrangement they've come to, and what that will do for jobs in Queensland. Uh, I know that manufacturers across the country are crying out for a solution around gas. Yet we have seen no details, uh, no evidence about what this impact will have for those workers and for those businesses, let alone for future investment. Uh, so we know how important gas is for both uh, feedstock and also the jobs that go with that. So we've got no sense from the government, from Senator Patrick, who came in here and did not explain uh, what was going to be done. Uh, so overall, uh, this is completely unsatisfactory. That uh, tonight we are expected to vote on these tax cuts. Uh, we're expected to um, just let this go where uh, Senator Patrick won't, won't outline what deals have been done with the government. Uh, Senator Cormann is saying that there is no arrangement in place uh, and the Australian people are being hoodwinked. Uh, well, it is not good enough. Uh, the Australian people absolutely deserve better uh, and we will continue to hold this government to account and we'll continue to hold Senator Patrick to account and never again will we be lectured to him on accountability or transparency ever again. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, this Labor Party, look at them, look at them. Talk about being so committed to a high-taxing, high-spending agenda 
that they will do absolutely anything to try to stand in the way of the Australian people getting the tax relief that the Australian people voted for at the election just on May the 18th. Just on May the 18th. And here we have a Labor Party who come into this Senate chamber and they will try to twist order. and contort Senator and Birmingham. take points Senator of Long order. On a point of order. I'm happy to withdraw my motion if you table the deal and we can get on with the debate. Order. Senator Birmingham, please continue. Mr President, indeed. These answers have been well addressed uh, indeed by Senator Patrick himself, by Senator Cormann, but you've got a Labor Party uh, who just want to find any justification for their hopeless inability to support tax cuts for hard-working Australians. That's what this is about. They're running around looking under rocks, desperately hoping to find some reason that justifies the fact that they can't bring themselves to vote for tax cuts for hard-working Australians. All of this could have been avoided if they just listened to the verdict of the Australian people on May the 18th. All of this could have been avoided if they just heard that the Australian people were supporting lower taxes, not higher taxes. And the reason that they got their lowest primary vote in 100 years, they got their lowest primary vote in 100 years is because of their high taxing agenda. Because you walked around places around the country and misled people. In your home state, Senator Watt, Mr Shorten stood there in front uh, of workers and said, well, I'll think about giving you a tax cut, when what his plan was was to actually Order. increase Senator the taxes Birmingham, on those workers. Um, the time for this debate has expired, pursuant to the motion uh, adopted by the Senate earlier today. Uh, we will be returning to the tax bills. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. <clears throat> I present uh, report number 93 of the Productivity Commission, A Better Way to Support Veterans. I call the clock.